Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Welcome. Wednesday night uh, here from the Fellowship Hall at uh, First Baptist Church. All three of us that are gathered here, many, many more of you gathered out there in your homes, living room, dining room, back porch, maybe even some away uh, out of town that are watching. Good to have you. I hope that today you've experienced the presence of God in your life, in your circumstances. I, I hope that you have walked in the knowledge uh, that you're covered by his shadow. And I thank you that God put it in your heart and you responded to come here tonight and, and to be a part of what we're doing. So it's good to have you. Okay, a couple of ministry updates. I want to jump into those pretty quick. Um, marriage night. That's coming up this Saturday from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Uh, we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. This is a three-hour uh, marriage building time. For couples, you can watch it from home, just you and your spouse. You can invite uh, uh, one or two other couples maybe to come over, join you for that, watch it as a group, and um, encourage one another. Maybe even share a meal just before it starts and then gather together. If you have children, it'd be great if you were able to get uh, child care uh, so that you could kind of watch it uninterrupted. But anyway, you've got to register by Friday. And uh, we have, right, I, I was uh, trying to uh, communicate a little bit with Ryan but I think we have around 16 or 17 couples right now that have uh, signed up for that. And that's, that, that's really, that's great right there. Uh, but I think there's some others that have said, hey, uh, we're going to do that. We just haven't registered yet. Let me just tell you, you need to do that before Friday. Or, or you won't be able to, to get in and get registered and, and whatnot and then pull that in so that you can watch it. So there you go. Marriage night's coming up. It's a great use of your time if you're married or if you're just thinking about getting married. Uh, it'd be a great thing to do here uh, in the days leading up to your wedding. Uh, hygiene kit uh, supplies. If you're uh, looking for a way to be the hands and feet of Christ, uh, we are gathering supplies together, toothpaste and toothbrushes and um, body wash and soap and deodorant and, and, and all those kind of things uh, that we can put into kits uh, to give out to, I think it's fifth grade, boys and girls, and the goal is uh, uh, 200 total kits, 100 kits for the young men and 100 kits for the young women. So um, if you want to participate in that, all you, all you got to do is next time you go shopping at the Walmart or the Kroger or wherever you go, uh, if you can think to buy a couple of those items and then drop them by the church office, we're collecting them. And then a really cool thing is our students down here at the BCM uh, we'll actually be putting those kits together, and then we'll take them out to the school. So that's a great way that you can uh, hands-on um, minister in our community. Here's, a, here's another way that we have not talked about, okay? And I, I don't have a lot, a lot of information to give you because we, we just kind of got the information today. I think it was kind of slow rolling out. And so when I say this, you're going to, some of you out there, I'm glad I can't hear you, you're going to be like, why, why didn't you give us more warning? I, I didn't have any more warning. It just came into my hands today. But um, uh, the city of Cochrane is sponsoring a cleanup day. And it's this Saturday from 9 o'clock in the morning until maybe 12 or something like that. Uh, for those who want to participate uh, in the larger group, they're going to gather up there behind uh, uh, the, the courthouse, I think, or behind City Hall. When, you can go to the website and go, well, I got it right here in front of me. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, come to the parking lot behind the police department. There it is on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock and then kind of divide up. They got a list. I don't know what there. I'm on that camera. They have a list of some of the specific areas they're going to be trying to, to work on and pick up trash and, and just beautify our city. Uh, they've also got some sites designated if you have some old furniture that uh, you just you need hauled off. They've got a couple of places designated. But you can go to the cityofcochran.com, get information about this. Dwayne Fernandez kind of brought this to my attention. And so uh, if, you, if you want to have a conversation in a little bit more depth, give Dwayne a call. Uh, he's probably more knowledgeable than I am. So that's another way uh, that we can minister right there in our city. We started back Sunday school this past week. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Uh, not all of our classes are meeting yet, and that's okay. Um, but we actually had more people here for Sunday school than I was expecting, which is just, uh, I guess my faith is kind of small, and, and so I'm learning from that. But Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Was 160 or so in Sunday school? Yeah, about 160 people came at 9 o'clock. And we have Sunday school across the board from 
uh, nursery all the way up. And uh, I want to invite you back. We'll be here every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock worship in here. Overflow room will be in the sanctuary right now. In our Sunday school class that's meeting in the sanctuary, okay, that is uh, uh, the oneness class. Cookie Porter teaches that class. Um, but that is also the one class that is requiring mask in there, uh, in that room. And so if, that's, if, if your class maybe isn't meeting yet, but you're ready to come, if everybody's wearing a mask, come join that group in there in the sanctuary. And then you can just stay right there and enjoy the service, enjoy the fellowship of real human people sitting in the same room with you. Uh, so that's coming up on Sunday. So a lot of good stuff there. Um, you'll get your prayer list. I, I hope that you will pay attention to it. Uh, continue to pray for people. Uh, Mr. Larry Purser, uh, uh, Ms. Carol Bowden, pray for um, Bob and Stevie Little, their families, Miss Stevie, um, I mean Miss Pete, uh, her funeral is today, and um, it's just a really beautiful thing said about her, her life and her family. Uh, so pray for Stevie and Bob and that extended family, continuing to pray for Miss Eloise and Mr. C.B. Churchill, Tim Falk. It's Nadine Rowland, who's at Northside, Macon. Uh, praying for Brandy Davis, her family. Brandy Davis's grandfather passed away, Mr. Aldine Johnson. And also praying for the Williams family. Kevin, his family, Chuck passed away. And then there's so many needs on this prayer list, so many ways you can pray for. We've got our missionaries listed on here, some that we know by name, our International Mission Board missionaries, our North American Mission Board, people who are in our different care facilities just... So many things, and, and we have a new name. I think it was last week I said something about that we were down to just one couple on our expecting. And now we've got two. How about that? See how that, that works? Yeah. And so congratulations to Aubrey and Carrie Floyd, who are expecting in March of 2021. Just a lot of, a lot of good things going on there. So there's your prayer list. Um, I know that each one of you have things going on in your life that I don't know about. Uh, the larger church maybe doesn't know about things that maybe you've not told anybody about uh, because that's the way life is. Life just happens every day. It happens while life is happening. And, um, and so I want you to know that uh, I pray for you it, it, um, in a general sense and also in a, in a very particular sense, even though I may not know all that's going on in your life, uh, just as you don't know all that's going on in mine. So let's be faithful to lift one another up to stand in the gap to pray for our community, for our state, for our nation, our world. Uh, so join me in prayer. Father, we love you today. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray maybe right now in this moment, uh, above everything else maybe going on in our lives, that it, right now, at this very moment, by your Holy Spirit, that you would remind us that we, we come to you only because of what Jesus has done for us. Father, remind us that we were hopelessly cut off from relationship and fellowship with you because of our sin. We were hopelessly lost, not just in this life for all of eternity. But Father, you loved us so much, you, you gave your one and only son to come to this earth, to, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to take the penalty for the sin of all humanity so that those who would receive this incredible gift of Jesus Christ and the salvation he offers, we might be forgiven and we might come back into fellowship, deep, rich, intimate fellowship with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father. So God, in this moment, remind us, we are gathered here on the Internet calling your name all because of Jesus. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve your attention, now, because we're your favorites. Father, we're, that's level ground right there at the foot of the cross. And uh, so we thank you for Jesus. For, for the needs that we have mentioned specifically, Father, we trust those to you. For those that we don't even know about, the people maybe even watching this broadcast, uh, scattered wherever they might be, the things that they're carrying in their life, their heart, uh, relational issues or emotional, financial uh, vocational, just so many things that uh, we deal with in life. Father, thank you that you are with us every step of the way. And Father, my prayer in Jesus' name is that you would make your peace and presence known to all who are searching for you, to all who maybe feel desperate 
to all who may be losing hope. Father, remind them of who you are. And now by your Holy Spirit uh, in us, your presence all around us, would you speak to us through Scripture, encourage us, give us guidance, convict us. Uh, Father, your word is, is powerful. It's alive. And I, I pray that you would just use it to feed us here in these next minutes. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to watch a, um, a little video, um, a little bit of a challenge video to us as we get ready to jump into some to some scripture. So if you will just keep watching your screen. I started to point people up here. If you'll just watch the screen. If you'll keep watching your screen, it should be starting right. Oh, believer. Wake up. Open your eyes to the empty and the hopeless around you. Hear their cry. Rise. Rise up and run. When you get tired and when you fall, press on, press on. You have nothing to fear for the chains of death were cut by the cross. And share the good news, our debt has been paid by the blood of our Lord and Savior. Oh believer, live, live like the tomb is empty. And show the world Jesus lives, Jesus lives, Jesus lives. Okay, um, there you go. This idea that um, we are called to really get out there to run, run to the world, run, run to those who are, are so in need of, of hearing and experiencing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Run. You've got to get outside the, the walls of what makes us comfortable, the walls of our buildings, the walls of our groups that we're most comfortable with, and really engage and, 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 and bring light and, and hope into the, to the lives of those who are seeking. So I want us to um, look at... Uh, uh, part of the life and ministry of Jesus while he walked on this earth. It's in Luke chapter 8. Uh, get your Bible, whatever you use for your scripture. And uh, the scripture will not be on the screen that you're watching. Uh, I think we're all going to put the reference up there, Luke chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 40 through 48. Um, that'll be up there for a few minutes, uh, just to remind you. But, okay, so we're picking up chapter 8. I mean, 40 verses in, but there's been a lot of stuff already happening in Luke chapter 8. Jesus is doing some great teaching, and he's using parables. And, and, you know, and people are like, well, okay, what does that parable mean? So he's doing a lot of teaching and explaining. And then there's this incredible thing, uh, just you know, before we get down to verse 40, where uh, there's a man who's demon-possessed, and Jesus is involved in, in the process of, of uh, releasing him from that uh, demonic possession and, and restoring his, his mind and restoring him to himself. And, and of course, that's that great passage where the demons are cast into the pigs and the pigs run off the cliff. And so everybody gets mad. They're not even looking at the guy who's now healed. They're mad about the pigs that are no longer gone. They ask Jesus to leave. So a lot of stuff going on, but the word is spreading. People are hearing about what's happening uh, in the ministry of Jesus, what's, what happens when when Jesus is around, you know, stuff, stuff's happening. And we'll pick it up at verse 40, okay? So is everybody there? Luke chapter 8, verse 40. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him. Okay, so there's a lot of people there. And I promise you the word's been spreading. You know, the word about the pigs and, and the guy being healed from his demonic possession. And, I mean, word's just getting out there. He comes, the crowds are there. They welcome him for they're all expecting him. They're so excited and expectant about What's next? What is, what is this man called Christ? What, 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 what's going to happen today? We want to see. So just then, he's just getting back, and there's a bunch of people around. There's an air of excitement and high energy and all this kind of stuff. 
And just then, a man named uh, Jairus came. So this guy is fighting his way through the crowd, and he comes up to Jesus, and he was a leader of the synagogue. Now, this is an interesting thing. This Bible study is not even about Jairus, okay, except that he's in this first part, and so we've got to talk about it for just a minute. I, I have no idea what his knowledge of Jesus Christ was. This is the only place we meet him right here. But it's interesting to me that God gives us this little detail that he was a leader of the synagogue. Okay, the leader of the synagogue was kind of like what we would call the, the, the chairman or the president. Uh, it was an administrative position in, in the local synagogue. This guy was in charge of just all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, administrative stuff. Kind of like what uh, churches today, a lot of churches, they have what they call an administrative pastor who just really looks after, you know, all the things like related to scheduling and, 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 and ministry and staffing and all these kind of stuff. But we know he was a part of, of organized Judaism. He was, he was an elected official in the synagogue. Well, it was some of those elected officials and leaders of the synagogue that led to Jesus being wrongly accused and crucified. In other words, Jairus is a part of the very system that will, not many chapters from now, um, be behind Jesus being wrongly accused and crucified on the cross. So, wow, what an interesting character in this story. So there's all this excitement. Here's Jesus, and Jairus came. And, and you know he's having to fight his way through. He was a leader. He was a, he was a Jew, Jewish leader, part of Judaism. And he fell down. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house. This... This is just an amazing moment right here because, you know, the, the Jewish uh, structure, those in power in Judaism, G Jesus was not liked by hardly any of those. But in this moment, Jairus is humble. He's, he's fallen down and pleading with Jesus to come to his house. Verse 42, because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was at death's door. Okay, now, that's all we're going to hear about Jairus because we're going to stop before we get to the continuation of his part of this story, which, by the way, is pretty cool because of it later. Jairus sends word and says, never mind, Jesus, she died. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, contraire. And he goes and he raises her up. This is an amazing story. But I do want to make this one point. Just as I, as I read this about Jairus and was just doing some study and some application and whatnot, and it just kind of began to dawn on me how many times in my ministry of 30 plus years it's not, it's not until a child gets into serious trouble that a lot of parents really seek out Jesus. And it's such an interesting thing. I mean, I've pastored churches, and, and there, there, there are, uh, have been families that are on the roll, and of course, we have, we have them here at Cochran, too. Every church has them. People I've never seen or never talked to. And, and, and then maybe somebody comes by an office, and our secretary calls back and says, so-and-so wants to know if they can come talk to you. And I'm like, who is that? Well, they're a member here. They, they hadn't, you know. And I said, oh, okay. What about, I don't know. They just look upset. And so they come back, and I, you know, I say, hey, well, well, my name's Keith Russell. I'm the pastor here. Good to meet you. Um, and, uh, and then they sit down with tears, and they say, my son, my daughter, our son, our daughter, has done this or is involved in this or this has happened to them, and, 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 and we're just devastated. We don't know what to do. And, and, you know, on the one hand, they came, not to, not to me, but seeking out Jesus is the absolute best thing to do when your child's in trouble. That's a great thing. I, if you're a parent out there, okay, or a grandparent, either one, primarily parents, l let me encourage you with this, if I can. Wh why don't you start passionately pursuing relationship with Jesus now while everything's going good? Why don't you show your child what it looks like to have a, 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 an intimate, passionate, deep walk with Jesus Christ and a, and a deep, deep faith and how he works. Why don't you go ahead and start building up those spiritual reserves and start strengthening those spiritual muscles? Because I, you know, I'm a parent of 
uh, four altogether. You know, one adopted three uh, biological children and, and then several, what we call them our college children that have lived with us here uh, upstairs in our house in the years we've been here. And, and I want to tell you something. Mom, Dad, if you're sitting out there, okay, there's going to come some point where your child's going to break your heart. There's going to come a point where something's going to happen. You know, I don't know what, what where, chances are where your heart's just going to crack right down the middle and you're going to be like Jairus and you're going to be like, what? And so don't, 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 don't wait till that moment to come falling at the feet of Jesus. Go ahead and start now. Go ahead and start growing in that relationship with Jesus. Go ahead and start, you know, really building the strength of your faith and your trust in him so that when that moment does come, you, you're, you're like, okay, let's see what God's going to do. There's not that, that same sense of desperation because you don't wait. Don't wait till it falls apart. Show your child now what it looks like to have a passionate walk with Jesus. Okay, so anyway, uh, that's enough about Jairus. Or that's all about Jairus for tonight. So Jesus, Jesus says, sure, and I love that. He's like, Jairus, seriously, no, it's not that. Jesus just starts going. And, and while he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. These are details that are important to what's fixing to happen. This is a very familiar part of the story. It's called a miracle on the way to a miracle. Okay, so now he's on his way to heal this girl. Eventually, she'll be dead, and he'll be raising her from the dead. And while he's on the way, the Bible says the crowds were nearly crushing him. Just people everywhere. And a woman, here's, here's the main character of our study tonight, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors, yet could not be healed by any. And if you go over and look at Mark's account of the same story, Mark kind of adds the detail, and in fact, had gotten worse. A uh, little punch to the gut there of the uh, people she had given all that money to. So here's a woman who's desperate, and her desperation is not because of something that is happening to her child. Many of us can relate to that desperation, but also many of us can relate to the desperation of a physical a sickness, a physical situation that just keeps on and on, and it, nobody seems to know, no doctor seems to know, the, the x-rays don't show anything, I don't know why you're having this, or what's going on, we just don't know. She, man, 12 years, that, that, is, a, that is a point of absolute desperation. I, I think it's kind of cool. I, matter, I don't know this woman. I've, I've never met her, obviously. I, I will meet her one day, but I haven't met her yet. This is my take. This is my take on her. She had lost hope. She pretty much had resigned herself to a life in the shadows. We talked about that a little bit Sunday morning. To life on the fringe because of this issue of bleeding. Just constant bleeding. I mean, how, how are you going to do anything, go anywhere with, with, with any kind of confidence? You got that kind of thing going on. And, you know, in hygiene, it, back in the first century, well, I wasn't anything like it is today. I mean, wow. But somewhere, somehow, this woman had heard a story or stories, maybe her friends had come in one day and said, friend, listen. I know you're miserable. I know you don't have any money left. I know you've tried everything in the world that you know to try. Now you don't have the resources to try anything. But listen to me, friend. There's this guy, Jesus. And, and we've been hearing these stories, and we've actually gone a couple of times when he was teaching. And this, this is a guy that's doing stuff that nobody else can do. It's, it's crazy. It's amazing. I mean, people are being healed just like right there, right there in the moment. And it's like, what? And he's not charging the money. He's not like all the other hucksters out here. He's just doing it because he loves them. And then he's talking to them about stuff like, you know, not only are you cured, but you're, 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 you're delivered, you're, you're saved, you're healed. Get up, go, no more, you know. It's amazing. And, and so they probably, I can imagine almost that there were, there were times when her friends would seek her out and, and say, I, I know it's hard for you to come out. I know you're so self-conscious when you come out because of all this, this, this issue that you've got going on. But try, 
this guy, you need to come. I don't know. I'm just kind of wondering if it's not something like that. Because the picture here is of a woman just kind of on the sly, trying not to get draw any attention to herself. And I can understand why you can too, I hope. Seeking out Jesus. But here's the cool part to me. Even though everything else had failed her, everything. Something moved in this woman's heart to seek out Jesus. For 12 years, nothing had worked. Now see, today, today we, we, we maybe can't excuse ourselves when we wait and go to Jesus as our last resort because we've been, we've been hearing about Jesus all our life, most of us. But you got to remember, Jesus is, this, this is his first time here. Scripture hasn't been written when this is going on. Now it's just word of mouth about this guy named Jesus, Jesus the Christ. Some people say he might be the Messiah. I don't know. Some people say he's a prophet. I don't know. But man, stuff happens when he starts teaching and, and touching people. It's amazing. So here's a woman who maybe had lost all hope. She had lost all her money. She didn't have anything. I doubt there was anybody to care for her but because of her medical issue. Probably if she ever had a husband, he had put her out. And somebody, some way, directly or indirectly, she heard about Jesus. And the way God does it in her heart, something clicked. And it was like, you know what? Everything this world offered me failed me. But for some reason, I need to find Jesus. And so she does. Verse 44 tells us she approaches from behind. So that's what I mean. This wasn't somebody who wanted the spotlight. This wasn't somebody running up to the front, you know, in front and hollering and saying, look at me, listen to me. I'm important. My situation is important. No, no. She approached from behind and she touched the tassel of his robe. I, it's just incredibly powerful, faithful, and humble response to Jesus and his presence. She just, something spoke into her heart. This guy's for real. And she was so used to having to cover up and, and be careful and, and, and stay away from crowds that she, she thought, I did, with all these people, I'll just kind of quietly work my way through. And if I can just touch him, I don't even need him to know who I am. If I can just touch him. If I can just touch him. Well, the end of uh, right there, verse 44, all that that she did, and in that moment, the Bible says instantly, instantly her bleeding stopped. Years, 12 years, every therapy and doctor and medicine and, 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 and every scent that she had wasted on what the world offered. And something in her heart said, go to Jesus. And she was so, so reticent and, and, and so used to being in the shadows and, and, and so used to being... Uh, being forced into kind of a, a, a loner way of living that she just snuck up and touched his robe, the hem of his robe, and instantly, instantly, the bleeding stopped. I, I, I feel confident that this woman, she was satisfied right there in that moment. She, she would have been fine for the crowd to keep moving and Jesus to keep moving toward Jairus' house and for, for, for her to just be able to stand there quietly till all the crowds had gone and she could really begin to process the bleeding for the first time in 12 years has stopped. Who is this guy? I touched him and my physical ailment was cured. Because, see, that's what she came for, I think. 
was to be physically healed. And that just happened instantly. What she didn't count on <laughs> was Jesus' response. Verse 45, who touched me? That's kind of a funny question to ask when the Bible has already said the people were pressing up against him. There's a crowd. They were excited. They were respected. Jairus came. He's got a sick girl. So everybody's kind of moving in this direction. In the middle of all that, Jesus stops and looks around that crowd. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And then when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Somebody touched me, said Jesus and this was a different touch than bumping up. This was a different touch than brushing against somebody because you're in the crowd. This was someone touching, touching, and behind that was an incredible expression of faith, even though this woman didn't know for sure who Jesus was. She had heard enough of the stories of Jesus to have faith that if she could just touch him. Her touch was her expression of faith. As she reached out for Christ. And he says, somebody did touch me. And I know because power went out of me. Not that Jesus was diminished in his power. But he just sensed there was a, there was a divine interaction between whoever touched him. And the power of the, the holiness presence of God in him. The healing that went out of him. Real quick, let me just throw this out. Uh, that's interesting to me that Jesus said, I felt the power go out of me. This is a good reminder to all of us. If, you, if you're going to decide to roll your sleeves up and get out of the cocoon of the church and get out of the walls of the church and really mix it up out there in our, in our world and wash people's feet and serve them, whatnot, it's, it's a good reminder that serving is, uh, is, is going to test our spiritual reserves. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take away from us. And, and that's why if you look at Jesus, often he was taking his disciples and said, let's go out here and pray. Let's go out here and eat some breakfast by the seashore. Let's go up into the mountains. We just got to get away sometimes. We can't constantly always be serving without being filled as well. Because when we serve, we're given away of ourself. We're given away of what God has been teaching us. We're working and serving in the power that uh, we are experiencing, the strength we're experiencing from God as we do that because we're human. Christ was not diminished. We're diminished. And so if we're not careful, we get to where we run out of uh, that, 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 the depth of that spiritual energy because, we just, because of our human frailty. And then we, if we're not careful, we begin to, to serve, but it's no longer out of love. It's because we have to, and, and there's no joy in it, and, and, and people sense that, and it's very empty, and, and there's no power. We have, to, we have to take times to get away. My wife is always on me about that. Keith, you need, you need to go off somewhere. You, you just need to go two or three days. I'm, I'm having a hard time living with you at home. I just need you to go somewhere. Get your heart and mind right. Um, and all of us need that. All of us need that. Verse 47. So when the woman saw that uh, she was discovered, I can't wait to meet this lady one day. Because if, I think if, you were, if, if we could have been there ahead of time and asked that lady, okay, ma'am, What's the worst scenario to you? And you know, what's the worst thing that could happen here while you're trying to kind of uh, come up there real quietly just to touch the hem of that dude's robe, Jesus? Uh, what one thing could happen that would absolutely mortify you? Guess what? It's happening right now. She was discovered. Attention was called to her. For 12 years, she's been accustomed to nobody paying her attention. For 12 years, she's been accustomed to having to hide from the attention of people so she wasn't uh, uh, commented on or so that she wasn't looked at funny or so that people didn't, 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 um, didn't react weirdly to her. And so now, even though the bleeding has stopped, you she not even had time to really get her mind around that, like, what? And, and now Jesus said, hey, who, who touched me? And she's like, oh, no. As she was discovered. And you can see that in her response. She came trembling. She was trembling. Nerves, fear, uncertainty, lack of confidence, all those things. She was trembling before Christ, whose robe she had just touched. And she fell down before him. And in the presence of all the people, she gave her testimony. She declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly cured. Okay, that word cured, okay, that is a word related to physical healing. 
I want you to keep that in mind. She said, I came seeking help with this bleeding problem. I touched his robe because I'd heard these stories, and I was healed. I was cured. Daughter, daughter, already, what do we see? The intimacy of relationship. Jesus didn't look at her and said, lady, what? He didn't look at her and say, woman, what are you thinking? Daughter, man, you're talking about an intimate way to address this woman. She probably hadn't heard somebody address her with such love in at least 12 years. And her bleeding had stopped. And now here's this guy that she's not, but not really sure. Nobody was really sure who he was. They just knew he had great power and he had great teaching and, and he had a lot of followers and people were being healed. And now she was one of them. And he looks at her and he says, daughter, daughter, your faith. See, Jesus understood the faith element of all that she had done to touch his robe. Even though she was seeking a physical cure, which she says, I was cured. Your faith has made you well. Which is a different word than the word translated cured. Because that word translated well is the word we translate most often associated with salvation, sozo. You, th- you came here thinking you were just going to be physically healed? Daughter, let me tell you something. You're saved. I've healed you inside and out. I'm not going to let you come here and get healed physically and then leave you be because you're going to die one day. And when you die one day, I want you home with me. And because of your faith and because you came and humbled yourself, yeah, you're cured, but let me give you better news. You're healed. You're saved. You're my daughter. Go in peace. Now, and we're going to stop there because it picks right up with Jairus' story. Jairus' story from here on out. Go in peace. We have no way of knowing what this woman did when she left this moment. None. She couldn't send out a mass text to everybody because they didn't have cell phones yet. But she went somewhere with someone or some people And she celebrated the good news of not just her cure, but she shared the good news of her healing, her salvation. She then was able to go to people and say, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. He's interested in way more than our sickness. He's interested in our heart. It's an amazing story. So, you know, um, I'm going to leave you with this thought because it's time to go. We're going to close with a song. It'll be a closing prayer. I have done this in my relationship with God over the years. And I know of people who have done it, and I've shared life with people, and we've shared conversations. Most of us, when it comes to how we relate to Jesus, most of us, have a tendency to do the same thing this woman did. We know we're not deserving. I, w- I would say that most of you watching out here tonight, there, there may be one or two of y'all and y'all, y'all are messed up, but the rest of you, we know we're undeserving. And we know that even since receiving Christ as our Savior, we have stumbled horribly at times in our life. That there are days when it does not really look like we love Jesus all that much, but we're still his, we know that. And so in our coming to Jesus, what that translates into for a lot of us is that in our coming to Jesus, we're really kind of timid about the things we talk to him about and the things we seek and the things we ask for in his name because there's something down inside of us. And, of course, the devil's right there messing with us in that thing. And there's that little voice behind us saying, Seriously? Why would he want to do that for you? Why would he want to work in your life that way? What have you done to earn that kind of love or blessing from God? And, and, and all of us would have to answer nothing because we cannot earn any of it. And we struggle to fully comprehend and grasp what it means when we say, Jesus loves us 
unconditionally. He loves us extravagantly. And he pours himself out into us in ways we can't even imagine because it has nothing to do with our performance and whether we've earned it or not. It's got to do with the fact that I'm his son and you're his son. You're his daughter. And he wants you to know it all. He wants to fill you up to overflowing. He wants to give you that abundant life bubbling out. But a lot of us have never experienced that because we're kind of like this woman. I'm, I, I, I just, okay, I, I believe in Jesus and I, I'm going to pray the prayer and, and I know I'm saved, but I, I doubt Jesus could ever use me for anything because of the mess of my life. And friend, that is the devil's lie. Russell, have you thrown up that last little slide yet? Yeah. Go ahead and throw it up there. Let me know when it's up. Okay. You're looking at a slide on your screen that I can't see up here anywhere and that I forgot to write down in my notes. But basically, that slide says something like this. What's the first line? We're okay. We settle for small. We settle for small. Okay. Thinking in terms of a drive through Okay. You go to a drive through and, and you order, talking to the clown's mouth. Uh, I would like combo number two, please. What would you like to drink with that? I'd like water to drink with that because I'm going to be really healthy. Would you like to supersize that? No, no, no. Small size is good. So we, we tend to be, yeah, here we go. They're bringing it to you. Excuse me, one minute. Yeah, that's it right there. We settle for small. Jesus, listen, and we see it right here in the story. Jesus, he's all about supersizing his grace. And the presence of his grace and the power of his grace and the effect of his grace and his working in us and through us, he wants to supersize it and use us to change the world. And we're going to sit there and look at Christ and say, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll just take a small. I'll, I'm, I'm sad. I'm, I'm okay. I don't, I'm not deserving of the supersized grace. Just give me enough to get, get me to heaven and I'm okay. And friends, when you do that, you have allowed Satan to mess you up. This woman came to Jesus seeking, and she actually was satisfied with a physical cure. But Jesus, Jesus had bigger plans. He wanted to transform her life, not just in the here and now, but for all of eternity. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in that story. It's good. And a lot of it's got to do with grace. Understanding what grace is all about. Wrapping, allowing God to open our hearts and minds and, and to wrap our hearts and minds around the incredible, unfettered, unbounded grace that has been offered to us in Jesus Christ. The grace in which we can live and swim as sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. And so uh, we're going to close tonight's service. And I hope God has spoken some, some encouragement to your life. And uh, we're going to close. This will be our, our, our prayer. Um, and I want to encourage you there at home. Maybe you want to stand up and sing. Or maybe you want to, if you're with some family members, you want to get a little closer or hold hands on it. It's a very familiar song. Um, but let's uh, sing together uh, our prayer as we close tonight. And so here we go. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart My fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed 
My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. The Lord has promised good to me His word, my hope, secures He will my shield and portion be As long as life shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God